health. You can bridge that gap between, you know, often some intent to want to learn and the action of ac actually learning. Um, you are able to, to connect those dots, whether that's data, whether those are outcomes or case studies or just simple experiences. But the beauty of storytelling is that it, it brings to life information in a way um, that often connects um, and depending on what you're working on, will humanize a brand or an opportunity or create an emotional connection um, with someone else who needs to understand why it's important to be vested and invested in what you're doing, whether that is a cause, a business, an opportunity, a startup. Um, you know, what, what I've seen historically in more, my more than 16 years in this ecosystem as an entrepreneur, investor, advisor, what have you, is that you can have some big, bold, wild, crazy, awesome ideas, um, but half of the battle is finding the person with whom it clicks. And so storytelling can be that, that connective tissue that helps everything click um, and come to life. And it's great. And Elizabeth, over to you, because you hear stories every day in your capacity as an investor. So we'd love to hear your perspective on the importance of storytelling, especially for the entrepreneurs in our audience. For sure. I think storytelling serves actually a, a very specific purpose in pitching, uh, and that is differentiation. So we're in a world now where there are, you know, a bajillion and one startups, a bajillion and one funds as well. I talk with a lot of emerging fund managers and look at their decks. And I think that for any would-be funder, whether it's a funder of funds or a funder of startups, they get pitched a lot and they tend to see the same things over and over. Like, you know, for every idea that you have, there are five other people who are doing the same thing, right? Regardless of what it is. And, and that's fine. But what sets you apart is not what you're doing. And that's where I tend to see people really fall into the trap of, let's just talk about what I'm doing. But to really set you apart and differentiate yourself, like I would, I would actually play up, what is the overarching story of this? Like, why is it you're doing that? What is unique about you, like as a person or a team, um, in what you're going after? And how do you kind of weave all of that together with what you're doing? And that, I think, is really where the magic is in being able to stand out above the crowd. Wonderful. Well, in the interest of storytelling, I thought it might be helpful for each of you to share a story. And it can be a personal story or um, a story of somebody that you've seen where storytelling really made a difference, or maybe even and humility and, and authenticity where storytelling went radically wrong because it doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> and you know, to become a great storyteller, sometimes you have to fail in order to succeed. So um, either, either a success or a failure, and Elizabeth, we'll start with you on this one. So I guess building on what I just said, I mean, I think I can give you a concrete example with us at Hustle Fund. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people don't, stop to think about where do funds get their money, but we have to pitch a lot of people as well. And in the beginning, um, when we were first pitching in 2017, our, our initial deck was basically like, oh, this is us, these are the investments we've done before, and this is our track record, and this is a bit about our, our background. Not great. Like, <laughs> you know, that, that's pretty much like, well, you and everybody else, right? The other 1,000 plus micro funds out there. So over time, the evolution is about, okay, well, what is the story then that is unique to you that's compelling? For us at Hustle Fund, we're very mission-driven. Certainly, we would love to make a lot of money on our fund, but we're very mission-driven. And that mission is we believe that hustlers, entrepreneurs who execute with velocity, which is our definition of what a hustler is, ought to be able to access resources. And so as such, here is like our 30-year mission on how we want to change that. Part of that is in VC investing, but that's like the overarching thing. Like these are the things we want to change about the world. This is who we are and why we want to change the world per our background. So kind of tying all that together. Um, so that I think is an example of like kind of changing the, the factual of, oh, we do this, this is who we are and like weaving it all together into something much bigger that people can get excited about. And if you like our mission, then that's why you would invest. I love that, both in kind of the evolution of the story, because that does happen. We're all evolutionary in our stories. Um, and then moving from the what to the why, essentially, right? This is what mm -hmm. we do to the why we do it. It's such an integral part of connecting with others across the table. Lauren, how about you? 
So Elizabeth, I'm sure you'll appreciate this because I'm going to actually use um, a part of your fat of the founding story um, from Hustle Fund as a good example here. Um, okay. So I've known Eric Bond since the, the beginning of, uh, I guess, our respective careers. We both entered um, into the, the ecosystem at similar times and actually uh, were founding members over at YEC together, the Young Entrepreneur Council. And so just to talk about storytelling, I think a lot of the times people think storytelling has to be an article or like a press release, but we can also storytell and advocate for ourselves as well in, in simple, small ways, even um, through social media. And so the example that I want to be able to share is what I saw Eric kind of sharing in his own storytelling, which was dripping the journey, right? Like taking us on the journey of this is what I'm going to do next. And for me, when I noticed that with Eric, that first moment was his storytelling of business, but it came by way of Facebook. It came by way of, you know, I'm, I'm doing this with my family and this is what we're doing and our family's growing and here's what I'm doing next. Here's my going to be my next baby is how I remember him um, calling the hustle fund. And that, that is so important. And I think we need to move away from, from thinking that storytelling has to always be so formalized. I think storytelling can also be an organic part of how you just continue to share your journey as a professional, as an entrepreneur, as an executive, as so long as, of course, it's consistent. Um, the best storytelling is really compelling. But when, again, you feel connected to somebody's journey, and in this case, Eric did a great job. I was, I was liking all the baby pictures. I was like vested <laughs> in what he was doing anyway. And then it was like, oh, there's another thing? Okay, this is going to be the next baby, but it's going to be the business baby. Yes, go, go, go. I'm so excited for you. And I'll pitch you on also, I'm sorry? I'll pitch you to be an investor in our fund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it was beautiful, right? Because sometimes I think the importance as well of storytelling, and, and I know, Pam, you asked about some failures. I think the failures that I've seen are so many that I will summarize them. And what I will say in summary is that some of the biggest failures I've seen are not because the people powering the next business idea or leading the company um, or raising the next round aren't doing good work, but it's because they're almost so heads down in just doing the work. And it doesn't mean that you individually yourself have to always take on that storytelling charge, but you do need to know when to, when to ask for help, when the storytelling component is really important. And the failures that I've seen are from the people who just stay so heads down in their own little silo. And then when they emerge with something new, it seems completely disconnected from what we know them to have done or be capable of doing. Or how many times have I seen decks of people that I think I know well, and then I discover something in the deck and I'm like, wait, what? You know, How did I not know this? It, it needs to become an organic part of your story. And even if I take myself as an example, I say this often, um, if, if people wanted to remember and define me by my first success in my first business, that was going to be my fault because that meant that I was not a good enough storyteller of my own journey, my own expertise, my own experiences, and my own professional pursuits, right? And so just make sure that you're taking everyone along that journey. We're all entitled to pivot and change course and want to build different businesses and, and solve bigger, different problems and raise money and do something new. But let's just make sure that as you're on that journey, the same things that are motivating you, you take an opportunity to share with others to connect those dots so that you don't seem disjointed. We are now in this you know, beautiful space and time where you know, we're no longer calling folks jack of all trades. We're, we're kind of moving away from the multi-hyphenates, if you will. And we are really appreciating the diversity of experience that people can bring to the table and that founders can bring to the table and business leaders can bring to the table, but that's new. And so in order to harness the power of why that's important, we have to harness the power of why the diversification of those skill sets is so important to being an effective leader, an executive, a founder, what have you, into the future versus um, what I've seen historically happen in the last 10, 12 years is that we shy away from some of the things that maybe we, we tried and didn't do as well as we wanted to, or we did for two years and decided, oh, I don't want to be in this industry. Own it. Like own all of that because those experiences lead up to what you do next. All of those experiences matter because they inform your why, your how, your what, as so long as you are telling that story in a beautiful way that is effective and powerful. And you will know that it is powerful when it is most effective.
I want to go back to something you, you were mentioning, which is there, there's like an explosion of storytelling platforms that we have available to us now. There's um, social, there's podcasting, there's speaking opportunities like this. There's every presentation you get, whether that's internal at your company, external to your company, um, the elevator pitch, uh, the, the classic elevator pitch. Do either of you have ones that are your personal favorites and, and or maybe why you use one platform for one aspect of your storytelling versus another? And Elizabeth, let's start with you. So I think that, um, you know, everyone is strong in different channels. And that, you know, some of it is also related to sort of the, the gifts that you're given, right? Some people just have a really nice sounding voice, in which case maybe podcasting or video is, is the way to go as opposed to blogging or tweeting or whatever. And, um, and then some of it is just more learned or practice. Like some people are, you know, have really polished their presentations for video or, or some people are really great writers and they've really honed their craft. So I would go with the channel that seems to be, you know, the greatest strength to a particular person. And, and as to how this pertains to startups, actually, that is actually fantastic for startups because now there are a million and one ways you can submit a pitch, right? You can make a video, you can make an audio recording, although I haven't heard anybody, I don't see why not. Um, certainly a pitch deck, um, you know, a blog post. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that people can do that and, and really play to their strengths. Um, and, and so actually uh, one example that I would give is um, uh, a couple of years ago, I backed this company called The Crew. And Tiffany, the CEO, is, is very charismatic. Um, you know, when she speaks, it's like, wow, that's very mesmerizing. And that really works well for her. And so when I, when I heard her pitch, it was actually uh, when she was speaking. And I was thinking, like, if I had received a pitch deck from her and seen the pitch deck, I felt like the story wouldn't have been as powerful as her speaking it. Like, that is a channel that she should just, like, play up all day, every day and really knock out of the park. So that's an example of that. So like kind of figure out what that is for you and then really just go whole hog on that. Yeah, and I'll say, this is so, this is what I love about, about my work these days is um, all of the dots that continue to connect. So Tiffany Dufu is a dear friend. Um, actually, li we live not far from each other as well. And um, I, I wanna point this out because I think it's also super important is that Sometimes we second guess ourselves on like, what, what is the best platform for us? What is the best medium for us to be expressing and pitching and telling our stories? And you'll know, Tiffany's a great example, because that is her home run. It is being charismatic and being in person. That's how I met her and fell in love with her myself um, years ago. And at that point, she was actually at White House Project. Um, and I had invested in, in Levo League. Um, and then I brought her over uh, when White House Project closed to be our chief leadership officer at the time at Levo. And so to see her go on and build the crew has been incredible, but her power is for sure in in-person verbal storytelling and her, her animations of hands and, and, and the way that she speaks just pulls you in. Um, and so, so even when Tiffany was starting the crew, it was clear. And I would say to her, we got to get you in front of people. Like you need mm -hmm. to always be in front of people. Um, but to Elizabeth's point, not everybody has that strength. Not everybody has that natural charisma or confidence to walk into a room so boldly and tell your story and make an ask, right? Like telling our story is one thing, but following it up with <laughs> an ask of any kind um, is, is very hard for a lot of people, even the, even the best storytellers. You, some, some of us freeze um, at that idea of asking for a check, a business deal, an introduction, of just simply making any kind of ask at all. And so I do say, um, it's important to figure out the elements and the components of your story that are most compelling and most important to, um, to what your objective is, right? If that's fundraising, then of course, you're going to talk about your business and why it's important to invest in it. Um, if, it's, if it's your next job opportunity, if it's a business partnership, if it's a joint venture, you're going to speak to um, what you know to be most important. And I would hope that you also round that out with, with advisory and insights from um, other areas that might not be your core area of expertise, but then you do have to sit back and say, which platform, which medium is the way in which I'm going to be most effective and best received? Um, and, and so when you look at some of these 
even new platforms now like Clubhouse. It's there for a reason because some people mm -hmm. feel more comfortable on audio only. So maybe, maybe we'll start seeing audio pitches. Who knows? But everyone has to find where they're most comfortable instead of um, worrying about the format that they think is most popular, right? Popular doesn't matter if it's not effective for you. Some people might make the best decks. Um, and it's been interesting, especially in this time, I'm seeing people who are saying to me, wow, actually this whole Zoom only social distance thing is working really well for me because half the battle was, you know, me in the elevator being, having tons of anxiety, just going up to the meeting, but they know that they're really great at the deck and they get this anxiety from giving the presentation in person. And so being able to be behind the screen has given them a, a newfound sense of confidence that makes their storytelling more compelling and more impactful for their business objectives. So I also say have little parties if you can with, you know, friends and family circles as well to test out your messaging. We, we used to do these things in person and, you know, in the VC startup landscape, it's often that you'll do like a little pizza party in your apartment or something and invite some friends over and pitch them in the idea and, and see what they think and what they say and then tweak accordingly. Um, do that in the digital landscape, do that over Zoom, do that any way that you can to test your story because the other thing is that sometimes when we're telling our stories, we make an assumption that our audience knows more than they know. Um, and again, the best storytellers are telling stories as if you've never heard the story before. And if you're really good, even if you've heard it before, we're happy to hear it again. I agree a hundred percent. Tiffany's, um, we all know Tiffany here. She is <laughs> probably one of the most charismatic speakers um, that I've ever met, charismatic individuals. But I wanted to use that as a platform that is a muscle that she was born with, but all of us aren't, yeah. <laughs> so we're not all Tiffany. Yeah. And so wanted to get your advice for the audience on where you go for help in developing your story, your storytelling skills, because I think assistance is fine and you know, how to best engage with assistance in your storytelling and to develop that, that muscle. And that can be assistance in the crafting of the story. It can also be assistance in, you know, practice, Lauren, which I think you also hammered home, which is a lot of people think some people get up on stage and just go. And that is true. Um, you know, my family gets tired anytime I'm doing a speech of hearing me practice at home in front of the mirror as I'm getting dressed in the morning. Like it's weeks and weeks and weeks of practice um, for me to make sure that I am fluid and that I own it and that my nerves when I'm getting in front of an audience um, are down. And so just curious as to what you think about resources for helping you with your storytelling and any comments you want to make on the practice element. Lauren, we'll start with you. Yeah. So it's funny during quarantine, before I joined Digital Undivided, I had so many women reaching out to me saying like, what am I doing with my story, my brand? Um, how are people going to find me? Um, because it, it's, it's funny to me just to take a quick step back, how many women pre COVID were afraid to have a personal brand for business purpose. Um, or who just thought that that wouldn't be welcome at work, as opposed to what happened during COVID and at the start of COVID when I had so many women coming to me saying, wait, how on earth are they going to remember me now when I'm one little icon on, the, on a big Zoom screen? How am I going to stand out now if you know, I'm not in front of people in the same way? Um, how am I going to stretch this other muscle and storytell effectively? But that often also means building a brand for which your story sits within, right? Even if we're talking about um, our business. And so I actually stood up um, within my company, Straight Up and Successful, which is my women's community, um, this personal branding boot camp, but it was all about business objectives. It was all about helping women tell their stories. And so the most um, important thing there, and I think the biggest learning lesson is uh, storytelling is not uh, bragging. Storytelling is not whether you're doing it for yourself or your business, because I know it feels more difficult for people to do it personally, especially if you're a leader, to kind of tout your own um, experiences and recognition and your own wins as you're trying to position yourself as a credible leader with a lot of integrity. It's like you, you, you kind of can't, you can't be silent on all you've accomplished, but then still want someone to know that you can lead. Um, and I know that that's a hard hurdle and it's an especially hard hurdle for women. Um, and it's even difficult sometimes with, within the business aspect when you're doing it not for yourself personally in the context of business, but, but on behalf of a company, because I've heard people say, man, I'm talking about all these great big dollars, but I wasn't here when this money was made, or I don't own the P&L. It, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. 
um, what matters is your ability to work with someone or within a framework that what I like to call the kitchen sink that is going to encourage you to take every single experience you have had without placing an emphasis on the things that I'm seeing. Oh, it doesn't matter because I wasn't paid for it or I volunteered or I was an unpaid advisor or um, I was on a volunteer board of directors. I, I kind of stop women. I'm like, no, 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 no. Hold up. Wait a second. You were a what? Oh, you were on, on a board. You were a board director. Let's talk about that. That experience matters. Um, whether we think it meets a certain set of qualifications or checks and boxes that we think are um, requirements, I ask that, that all of you, when you're thinking about storytelling, look at your wins, look at your professional wins, look at your, your accomplishments, look at um, the areas that you've learned in your career and in your business, and make sure that you're working with someone who is going to continue to push you and kind of tease that information out of you, as opposed to allowing you to sit there and say, oh, I don't know what I've done well because I hear that all the time. And, and it just takes a little more probing and someone who says, there's no experience that you've had that's not valuable. Let's put it all in this kitchen sink and then determine which of these stories, which of these experiences bolster um, the opportunity that we are going for for our business. And let's make sure that we tell that story better than anyone else can. Um, and that is always my, my big thing is no one should ever be able to be uh, a storyteller of your own journey, of your business, of your brand, your company, whatever it is that you're working on, than you if you're leading it. No one should be able to come in and give a presentation that wows more than you yourself. Great advice. Elizabeth? I think there are three main aspects to storytelling. So there's the presentation. I think you kind of chat about that, Pam. And then there's the crafting of the story, which Lauren talked about. But then I think the last piece, which maybe I'll hone in on is where your story fits in with the rest of the ecosystem. And this is where I think this is the, uh, the challenging part where it's hard to find mentors or coaches or even, you know, be self aware is you often don't really know what the rest of the ecosystem is pitching. And I, and I think this primarily pertains to if you are pitching a startup, you don't know what all the other pitches are. You don't know how you stack rank across all these other pitches. And so that's really hard. And I think though that part is also equally important as the other two where, you know, often founders will think they de they've delivered a great pitch. They spend a lot of time honing compelling things about themselves and the story, and they've spent a lot of time practicing, but they don't know that their story actually sounds exactly the same as somebody else's or it it's just for whatever reason not interesting to the listeners because abc event happened last year that has nothing to do with you right uh like that industry just may not be interesting anymore to vcs or whatever it is and you don't know that and it may have nothing to do with you but it affects you so i think for that last piece if you're a startup and you're you're trying to figure out where you fit in getting feedback or mentorship from other people who see a lot of, of decks uh, is really important. And it could be startup advisors, it could be angel investors, it could be VCs, it, it could be just anybody who sees a lot of decks. It could even be other founders who happen to talk with lots of other founders and look at people's decks. But I do think that getting that feedback, that honest feedback as to where do they, where do you fit in right now in the ecosystem? like? Is this a hot space? Is this differentiated? Did something bad happen in the industry last year, you know, such that nobody likes this idea anymore? Is there a big behemoth that has come out and gotten lots of funding in stealth that you don't know about and now everyone's afraid that you're going to be crushed? These are the kinds of things that I would try to get some, you know, I don't know what it's called, insider information or underground information on. And I just want to add to that for a quick second, um, because Elizabeth, that's a great point. And I, I also want to just drive home for a moment the importance of when you're storytelling, it's not just big vision excitement, right? There is, there, there's gonna have to be a way to operationalize that. Um, there's gonna have to be an idea that you're not just selling a, a vision, but that you have the ability to, um, to bring that vision to life and that you can execute. And so when we're telling stories for our business, yes, it's great, you need the buy-in, you need to set the vision, you need to get people super excited, 
but you also have to end the story on the note of execution, right? Like how you're going to execute, how you've already maybe executed and, and how you are already seeing some, some progress, but what the opportunity is because great storytelling is an invitation in business, an invitation to partner, right? It's an invitation to do business together. Um, and so just make sure that your, your closing note in your storytelling and your line of storytelling um, is always focused as well on execution and implementation. Um, I'd love to, great advice and, and love to segue now into um, authenticity. So I think as you're going out and collecting all this information, Elizabeth, like you're saying, like you're, you're bouncing the ideas off of people, you're asking for help because maybe storytelling isn't your strongest muscle or storytelling in a particular venue that you're forced into. You have to do a presentation, you have to do something. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, as a founder, you need to sift through that data and still, like there's still an ownership piece where um, there's only so much that you can outsource before it has to be your story and you have to be comfortable in the delivery. So are there any recommendations you have for how to sift through the information that's coming to you um, and to make the storytelling authentically your own? And Elizabeth, because you started with like, hey, go out and get the get the, the information, collect like that, and that final analysis. I'm kind of curious where you might guide entrepreneurs on this. Well, and then hopefully, ideally, you, you know, fundamentally what it is you're doing is rooted in authenticity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have come up with that thing that you're doing, hopefully. But I mean, sometimes people have to go on various personal and professional journeys to kind of figure out what it is they really want to do. Um, but, but that side, let's say that you are working on something that, um, you know, you're very happy about, I think that you can always, you know, ultimately you are doing it. So I, I, I kind of feel like that's less of a problem. Um, it's usually around the, the positioning of what you're doing and how that fits in with the greater landscape rather than, oh, you need to change what you're doing altogether. Lauren, how about you? Um, I would agree with that. And, and I think that's where for me, the personal connection when you're telling your story or even your business story um, comes into play because that, that emotional connection can only be created if someone feels that your story is authentic. So, you know, I'll say all the time, if you, and this is also where, where I say the kitchen sink and don't, don't devalue any opportunity, um, is that sometimes we think that we've got to have specific experiences or education to have credibility in doing something, but never underestimate the power of your own intrigue and curiosity. Some of the best entrepreneurs I know are self-taught in that particular industry. And sometimes our curiosity can, can take us far deeper um, in, in our learning opportunity, especially as a founder, right, of a startup of any kind. Sometimes those are the people that have given themselves a five-year crash course in 12 months because they just, they want to succeed so bad and they're so interested and so curious. So never, never devalue the fact that you didn't go to X school or work at X company prior. Um, you know, sometimes being self-taught and, and just hustling, literally like hustling for not just funding, but before that hustling for information and access. And when you go to tell your story, that will shine through as your authenticity. There's no way to be able to tell a story of someone who's you know, self-taught or who hustled for their mentors and advisors and, and what have you. And that's what, um, that's, what's also really important because in the startup environment, something has to sustain you. Um, and the story alone is not enough, but the hustle, the intrigue, the curiosity, the desire to win is. And the, the only thing I would add to that is like, I think one of the most powerful moments I had was in a Q and A, I was listening to a, to a panel and this woman came out with a very authentic answer, which is she was asked a question and I, I don't even necessarily remember the, the question. It was something about boards, but she ended up saying, um, her response started with, I know what I'm supposed to say here and it's this, but I'm gonna give you the inside scoop, right? And you could see that the whole audience just leaned into that authenticity of, I'm, I'm gonna drop the facade of what I think you know, the industry or this audience expects me to have, and I'm going to relate to you. And so I think that can be a very relatable piece. It, it's a chance to stand out um, by being authentic and, and being direct and, and being personal um, to break through and use that as a powerful storytelling lever. Um, I'd love to switch to, you're incredibly busy. You probably get lots of requests to 
speak on panels um, such as this. So how do you prioritize whether you're, you know, accomplished um, person who's getting tapped a lot or whether you're just starting, how do you prioritize where you spend your time and what speaking platforms you're going to be on? And Elizabeth, let's start with you. <laughs> well, um, I'm huge on time management and I think, well, I don't know how many people are parents in this room, digital room, but, uh, you know, as, as a parent of two little kids, like, you know, everybody only has 24 hours a day, right? That's something that we all have. And then on top of that, you know, if you have particular uh, areas where, you know, you need to spend time because you have dependents or, or whatever commitments you already have, then that's even less time. And so I protect my time like crazy. And the way I think about time is actually a little bit akin to the way I think about money. Like, you know, you should think about what is sort of the ROI on your time. And what does that mean exactly? Well, like if I do this thing, like what do I think, um, you know, that might lead to. And I think that's generally how I think about it with regard to online events. Um, you know, certainly there are a bajillion and one online events or even in-person events, though not these days, that you could be doing. And so what is it that you hope to achieve from that? And if everything goes well, like, you know, what do you think that kind of looks like? And, um, you know, it might sound very transactional, but I think the reality is everybody has to kind of think about their time in that way, whether it's about events or other activities. And, and that's kind of what I do. And so for events in particular, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we, our agenda is we would love everyone to hear about Hustle Fund. And that is a big factor in that. Like, do we think that that can happen at that event? And so thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, <laughs> Lauren. Um, I'll, I'll echo that, you know, as a, as a mom as well to two children. I'll say they're little, but they're not so little anymore. But then when I say that, everyone thinks my kids are so big. They're just 11 and 12. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a consideration, right? Managing time. And, and um, as Elizabeth said, it does sound transactional. And I hate for it to sound that way. But I have always... Um, prioritized where I feel I'm going to get the most leverage. And that's not just in business. It's actually how I approach all of my time in life, including the time I spend with my children. Um, so it's, it's also understanding um, very clearly what my participation means to, um, you know, an outcome or objective that I want to, that I want to achieve. And right now, certainly in my role um, as CEO at Digital Undivided, it is making sure that um, our work is front and center as I'm, you know, pushing the global shift for inclusive innovation forward for Black and Latinx women, um, that, that conversations that shine a light on our work um, or the future that we want to create are spaces that I absolutely have to be in. And then quite frankly, it's who makes the ask. And, and Pam, who, I can't say no to you. Like, I can't say no to you. So I'm here, of course. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but I do realize, and I think it's super important too, to just have time for yourself. You can't be an authentic storyteller. You can't be the best leader of your organization. You can't be on um, those things if you're not taking personal time as well. So that's an important piece to um, put into the mix is that you need to be a whole person in order to be an effective storyteller. Um, at this point, I'm seeing a, a lot of great questions that want to be asked. And so Grace, um, we're going to open this up and, and um, turn it over to you for questions to be directed to our panelists. Perfect. Um, I have quite a few questions, but I also, I know I wasn't asked, but I'm just going to chime in really quick as someone whose job is to program speakers for events. I think that uh, when looking for those speakers, we look for people who do have a good story, who have a brand, who have a voice. And so we are trying to get people who are well-rounded, who stand for something, who have interesting things to talk about. And so clearly the three of you have all of those things. And you know, my suggestion to anybody who wants to have more speaking opportunities is to create this, you know, this aura around you that's whether it's your Twitter feed or you've written some articles that someone can go and look at or watch them videos of you speaking from the person on the other side who's going and researching those are really, really helpful things to know before you program someone on a panel or in a conference or something. So that's just my two cents. But we have um, we have a couple questions specifically about VC pitching. Um, and so one question is about 
um, cold emails and approaching a VC um, with a cold email. And if there, even if there's no response, is it okay to describe your startup and your story in periodic updates? I think Elizabeth, that's probably focused towards you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. So I think, um, the world is changing. I remember when I had my startup many years ago now, like the, the common thing was, oh, nobody would look at cold emails. Now I would say it's very different. Certainly every emerging fund manager, angel investors, like they all look at cold emails. We do as well. I mean, 15% of the deals that we do are direct cold as in zero referral whatsoever. So um, I think what I would do just as a high level advice is certainly cold email, write a good cold email. <laughs> like don't, don't write this long thing and send it everybody and, and, you know, CC all the investors that I've certainly seen that that's not effective. Obviously you're not going to write a custom email for everybody, but to the extent possible, at least get their name right and make it slightly personal. Um, when you're emailing and the email goes, if you don't get a response. Uh, you know, it could also just be that the person didn't see it. Like if I were to describe my inbox, it's like, okay, email comes in and then like you go down to the bottom and I, you know, every day I try to dig myself out of it, but sometimes actually some of those emails go to spam and I'll find it like a week later or when somebody pings me a second time, it actually lands there. So I think this is where often founders are a bit afraid or timid to email again. And I'll give you a story for us at Hustle Fund. Um, we emailed one of our investors 13 times before we got a response. So, you know, people are busy, emails get, you know, dropped down to the bottom. You may feel like you're pestering the person, but actually it may be the first time the person's even seeing your email after you sent it for the fifth time. Um, yeah. So I would not assume that no response is a no. No response means that they got busy or didn't see your email, in which case I would just actually write the next email assuming that the person did not see it. Even if you notice in your whatever mail tracker thing that the person opened, it doesn't mean that they read it and gave it thought. And it may be that they thought, oh, I'll come back to it later, but then things got busy and seven days passed, right? And that happens a lot for everybody. So that would be my advice there. And so then to answer your question concretely, yes, it's totally fair game to come in with updates. But I would say I would actually just make the assumption they never even saw the first email. So I wouldn't just start jumping into all these other things because they don't even know who you are at that point. Got it. That's great advice. Um, in, a, in a very digital world now, people who participate in speaking engagements aren't just speaking to a room of, you know, a certain number of people. Many times these speaking engagements are recorded and now they're online for the world to see. And, you know, given a lot of um, hype around cancel culture lately, I think that there might be some fear in some people that they might say the wrong thing or approach something the wrong way. What would you ladies, what kind of advice would you give people um, who might be nervous about that type of thing? Lauren, I think <laughs> from your face, I think you might have some suggestions here. <laughs> um, I, I, my face is because, um, because I have a lot of feelings on this particular topic um, around storytelling and media, um, especially right now in the world of um, hyper opinions and critiques um, and stereotypes and just like this melting pot of um, often uninformed, ill-informed expectations. Um, and what we're seeing as well as it relates to storytelling and marketing and media and what have you is, um, you know, pushing us into a place where you talk about cancel culture, where we're also seeing um, clickbait, which, you know, historically in the marketing world, it's like clickbait is good. You need something that's going to get something to someone to open that email or as Elizabeth said, right? Like open the email. What's the title? It's going to get you to, to click or read or do or, or to take an action. But we're also seeing that used for for bad purpose right now. We're seeing that used for negative purpose as well. Um, and especially around cancel culture, specifically for communities of color. Um, I, I think that what I'm also seeing and worried about um, is how cancel culture can in many ways kill our culture um, because we rush to make judgments that are unfair, unwarranted, and unfortunately, because we are over consuming so much information in general, nobody's actually stopping to do 
their homework. And so Grace, as you asked that question, um, I think there's a lot of trepidation, right? Like even if we're talking about myself, you know, people are asking me, especially with the racial reckoning, like, what can I, what do I call you, right? Like everyone's on eggshells about the right words, right vernacular. Um, like, what can you joke about? Like, what's up for grabs or, you know, nothing is, what's okay, is nothing okay? Um, and so I, I think I'll say this, use common sense. You know, it's like, go, let's take it way back to when we were two. <laughs> like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Um, and, and, and trust your intuition on that, right? Like if, if you would want someone to say it to you, then feel comfortable saying it. But if, if, you, if you have to question saying it, I say don't say it at all. Yep, it's great, great advice. I think there's so many things in life that are like those basic things we learned as toddlers, like sharing and <laughs> being nice to others that people should just keep practicing. Um, okay, I'll do one more audience question that come, came from a few people and more about kind of pitching and, and funding. I'm wondering what the balance between being charismatic and really honest and open about your um, self and your company versus having just a really great product, having really solid numbers and stats and things like that. Is there a safe balance there? Do you think that some investors might appreciate more of a outgoing storyteller and some might really like the technical side? What, what would you say about that balance? Elizabeth, I'll have you chime in. Yeah. This, this one is uh, sort of an upsetting one to me, and I'll tell you why. Um, first off, if you are charismatic, you're naturally charismatic, you should use that because being charismatic in this industry goes so far. Um, you know, I've backed a lot of founders, both in a past life at 500 Startups, and then now with Hustle Fund, we've invested in over 170 companies, right? So I have a lot to compare. And I'll just tell you, like, from the numbers, like, if you are charismatic, it's easier to get funding. That, that's just how it is. Um, I see that with my founders now. I see that from my past founders. That's great. Doesn't mean it's easy. It's easier. Um, and, and to the extent even like if you have traction, like I'll give you an example, like one of our founders in our portfolio who is not charismatic, I would say, like actually quite not charismatic, but had amazing numbers, um, you know, got declined by pretty much every VC and we did some back channeling with one of those VCs and saw their essentially their memo on the whole thing and basically the first line was like he is not charismatic um and and uh, it's just amazing like actually it isn't until maybe you know series B or higher where I would say traction kind of really starts to take over, unfortunately. So if you're in the earliest stages, pre-seed, seed, pre-A pre and series A even, uh, being charismatic and storytelling goes a long, long way, re almost regardless of your numbers. And in some cases, if you're very charismatic can compensate for lack of numbers. Yeah. I, I thought- I'm keeping <laughs> up with the chat, sorry. Oh yeah, there's <laughs> people are giving you guys lots of praise. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. The only thing I would say, although Elizabeth really touched on it, is just um, me and my VC experience and angel investing experience. Yes, charisma goes a really long way, but I think it also depends on the stage of business that you're at, right? So um, earlier on, I think it's very important to be super, super charismatic, and I think it's always important to to present well and be respectful and 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 engaging, um, and of course professional, uh, but. You know, I think as you have more proof points, as you do get more traction and you're more, more mature in your business, um, you become less of a risk. And I think the, the charisma balance kind of changes a little bit with the numbers and, um, and traction. The only thing I would add to the conversation, obviously the earlier stage of the company, you're betting on the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the charisma comes, becomes so important. But charisma comes in many forms. Um, it's not only like that you're outgoing, but you can be a domain expert and just demonstrate like rule, like own the room in terms of your knowledge of an industry, even if you're not the most flashy sizzly, like we're not talking about just the sizzle, there can also be steak and steak, um, can be part of what is so charismatic about your pitching. So if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not that outgoing salesy type of person. Charisma comes in many forms. 
um, is all I would say as a, a shout out of encouragement to people. Awesome. And actually building on those points, like everybody can be cognizant and think, you know, deliberately go into every meeting thinking I'm going to have extra energy, I'm going to be louder, I'm going to be you know, sitting up in my chair, things like that. I mean, just quick anecdote on myself, when I was pitching my startup many years ago, um, I was pitching this one investor and at the end I asked him, so what do you think? And he said, I don't want to say the wrong thing and call you a meek Asian woman, but I do question how you will lead a, a team of 100 people. And I, w I was just so shocked and that, you know, that's a whole nother side of that situation. But after that, like going into every meeting, it made me think, well, if he thinks that I sound meek, then <laughs> I wonder what everybody else is thinking. So I need to be, you know, extra energetic, louder, sit up in my chair, all these things that I just mentioned. Um, and that actually helped out a lot. And we started closing checks. So um, everybody can be, bring their game just a little bit more. I have just a question, Elizabeth. <laughs> Sorry, where, where is he at right now? Yeah. Find this man. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. We don't care. We don't care. Doesn't You're matter. winning. You're winning. That's all that matters. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, great. Well, Pam, I'll let you continue on, on the uh, schedule of questions. Well, wonderful. I thought just in, in closing, um, in storytelling, is there one nugget one piece of advice that each of you would give um, and I always look at two sides of the equation to the storyteller and to the recipient and Elizabeth um, you just gave like hey, here's here's some advice for a recipient um, that made me <laughs> mad you can tell that that made me mad though right I was like I'll I'll give that feedback so so Lauren let's start with you and we'll, we'll conclude with Elizabeth but piece of advice to final piece of advice to the storyteller and to the recipient as well I would say, hmm, the best piece of advice to the storyteller is be unapologetic about all that you've done um, and, and own it. And, and when you own it, that confidence does shine through. Um, my um, words of advice to the recipient um, are to listen to a story and um, take the time to be a good listener before passing or creating judgment. Um, I think sometimes we, you know, we always hear this, like the first 30 seconds matters. Yes, this is true. But if somebody's got, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes on your calendar, um, listen for, listen intently for more than just the first 30 seconds to someone before you, you form an opinion or create a judgment or say you're going to pass. Elizabeth? I think, um, you know, either fortunately or unfortunately, um, you know, storytelling and, and I think we talked about being charismatic are important. Whether they should be or shouldn't be, uh, you know, I'm personally of the opinion that we should play down a, a bit and it's less important compared to what you actually do, but that's just how it is in life. And so as such, we all need to be able to optimize for that world. So what does that mean for everybody's going to be different kind of tying everything together? Like some channels will be easier for some people. If that's your strength, you know, do in person, do video. If writing's your strength, write more. Um, and then I think to the extent possible, get mentorship. And I use that word lightly, like not necessarily formal advisors, but talk with lots of people to get direct feedback on everything from how you present. Uh, to what is in the story and how it ties to you and also the landscape over, overall as to how you fit in. And, and then you just try to do the best you can with all those pieces to give yourself the best shot. And is there anything, I mean, I, I love this, uh, you know, grandma always said you have two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as far <laughs> as you speak. Um, is there anything that you would give to, you know, storytelling is, is a two-way channel. There's the storyteller and there's the person listening to the story. So is there any advice especially on the heels of um, some of that feedback, which it sounds like that feedback, well, ill-delivered, um, actually caused you to kind of up your game. So just curious in some ways, like what you would give to the, the recipient of the story or advice you would give to your industry or to other people um, based on your own personal experiences. I mean, I mean that's, a, that's absolutely a great point, Pam. Like actually listening to feedback on how you can improve is absolutely probably one of the best things you can do in life, not just 
you know, with pitching. Um, I think a lot of people just pitch and in fact actually use an entire meeting to just talk. But if you're just like talking at somebody, you don't really know what they're thinking. So to the extent possible, making it a two-way dialogue is important and really internalizing the feedback. It may be that the feedback is irrelevant or ignorant or whatever, but if you tend to hear the same feedback a couple of times, then maybe you should think about how you can either ad adapt or combat that, whatever that feedback is. I think that's great, great advice. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say is to people who are giving feedback is to use, I think Lauren, you said this, like think about whether you would give that feedback, how you would like to receive that feedback, how you would give that feedback. Would you, is that something you would say to somebody in your family? Um, there's different ways to give feedback and delivery. So that's a critical piece of this um, equation. So I wanted to thank both of you, Elizabeth, Lauren, you've been amazing. Um, and Grace, thank you to yourself and to Startup Grind for having us here for the session and to the audience for listening and engaging so actively on the chat stream. Um, it's been an amazing audience and interaction style. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Pam. And I also want to give always a shout out because you all just came out with this amazing um, Visionary Voices Speaker Bureau, which Lauren and Elizabeth are both a part of. Um, it's about a thousand women growing who are business leaders and run organizations who are open to speaking opportunities. So I'm going to drop in the chat that list of women that you can go through and reach out if you are looking for speakers for events. And it's yes. a wonderful resource. <laughs> Thank you. Visionary Voices uh, is our effort to showcase underrepresented voices. Um, and to make it easy for people who say, I, you know, I tried, but I couldn't find them. Well, now you've got a thousand to choose from and it's growing. The Speaker Bureau is open and we'd like to thank Startup Grind for being our partner. We not only um, are soliciting great women, but we're working with media conference organizations like Startup Grind who are committed to diversity in their panels and ending kind of the mantle, um, if you will. So uh, invite all to, to come and to participate. In Thank you ladies so much. We really appreciate your time and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you all. It's Thank been you. great. Thanks ladies. Bye. Bye.